department. We're talking about construction. We're also talking about protecting you as well as the patient. I'm going to try to, uh, how many slides do we have here? 31. Okay, so let's try to do 31 slides in the next five minutes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Let's be out of here by six. This time thing? Yeah. No good? Yeah, it's really screwing me up. <laughs> okay. All right. So radiographic protection features. We're going to be talking about each of these different categories. All right. So here we go. Protective housing. The protective housing wraps itself around the x-ray tube. Uh, you have the electrons traveling from cathode to anode. You have the sudden impact of the electrons converting it into X-ray energies, isotropically going around and all, going in all different directions, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Let's remember that, right? Yes. So those going through the window towards the patient is known as the? Primary. The primary or the useful beam. The protective housing should be lead lined. Should be lead lined, right? This is to prevent any type of radiation from leaking out of the housing. However, is there still possibility <coughs> of radiation being leaked out? Yes. Okay. If you recall, x-rays have many energies. So the weaker ones will be attenuated within the housing, while the stronger ones will penetrate through the housing. That's your leakage radiation. What category does that fall under? Secondary, Secondary radiation, okay. So leakage radiation must be less than 100 milli, milli what? Okay, we're talking about exposure rates, okay? So milli Rankins at a distance of one meter from the protective housing. Now you guys remember your units, right? Okay, rads, rads and grays refers to absorb dose. Okay, rads and grays refers to absorb dose, that is the the object or the subject being irradiated, okay? REMS and sieverts refers to what? Applies to what? Occupational exposure, okay, very good. <laughs> and then when we're talking about exposure, uh, exposure coming from a source, this is where Rentkins comes in, okay? So we're talking about exposure rate. So leakage radiation must be less than 100 million Rankins per hour at a distance of one meter from the protective housing. <coughs> All right, any questions? Okay, let's keep on going. Control panel. Control panel must have various indicators to identify technical factors and when exposures are being done. In your control panel, you have the ability to manipulate those technical factors. You got MA. Okay, when you select your ME station, are you not also manipulating your focal spot sizes, small and large? Okay, your time, your KVP, you may also indicate a timer, exposure rate, as well as dose. Now, when you're making an exposure, there should be visual and auditory alarms going on, right? Have you guys already experienced that in the field? Okay, every time you make an exposure, there's usually some kind of blinking or flashing light, as well as an, an audible, mm -hmm. okay? So those should exist. Any questions? Okay, these are all safety features, okay. Source to image distance, source to image distance receptor. What is the common SID that we use in radiology for common practice? Approximately 40 inches. Okay, approximately 40 inches. This measurement from source to image, where is the source? Is it <laughs> here or is it here? The arrow kind of gives it away, right? So your x-ray tube is up here. So it's going to be the distance from where your x-ray tube is to your image receptor. That's your source to image distance. So this can be uh, as simple as using a, a tape measure to measure your SID or as complex as lasers. The SID indicator, now we do quality assurance tests, and depending what it is that we are testing, it can be done semi-annually or annually, okay? For this particular test, the SID must be accurate within 2% of the indicated SID. Must be accurate within 2%. 
Now, as we know, any changes in distance, doesn't that also change the intensity of the x-ray beam? Yes. Okay? Therefore, we got to make sure that the SID is accurate, because any changes in that will also change the intensity of the x-ray beam, which will also influence patient exposure. Collimation. What do we know about collimation? What is it that we're trying to control with collimation? The beam size. Okay, we're controlling the size of the x-ray beam. Okay, we're controlling the size of the x-ray beam. What, is the, what are the collimators made of? Lead. Okay, is it composed of lead? Okay. They're composed of lead. Okay. <laughs> Thought I had that right. Now, for those of you who don't know what collimators are, they are a set of lead shutters. Okay. <laughs> Horizon horizontal and transverse. No, don't make sense. Controls again the size of the X-ray beam. Um, and what we are used to working with is a variable aperture, but we also have fixed apertures. Okay. What does an aperture mean? It's just an opening or a window, okay? But what we deal with is variable aperture, so we can, we can adjust the size of our x-ray beam. Remember, the x-ray itself cannot be seen, heard, felt, touched, tasted, etc., etc., right? So within the collimator housing, the box, okay, right here, collimator box, we have, uh, we have a light bulb and a mirror, a light bulb and a mirror that represents the x-ray field. So when you're setting up for the procedure, you hit that light and you can see exactly the size of your x-ray field. Okay? Now we have what's known as a PBL. Be familiar with that term. Okay? It's called a positive beam limiter or PBL. It is a variable aperture. Okay, so we can change the size of the opening or the window. Now, this aperture automatically regulates the size of the beam to the size of the image receptor. All right, so when you place a 14 by 17 image receptor in the Bucky, the collimating field is exactly to that size, 14 by 17. Now, it's called a positive beam limiter is because it won't allow you to go larger than the size of your image receptor. It is a safety feature. Okay, so it won't allow you to go larger than the size of your image receptor. That is the main feature of a PBL. Now, can you go smaller than the size of the image receptor? Yes, but you can't go larger than that. Doesn't make any sense. Okay. All right, as we also know, by collimating, the smaller the area, the less exposure that the patient is receiving, right? So we're controlling the field size, but we're also controlling the amount of exposure that the patient is receiving. Now, it's good in two ways. When you collimate to the size of interest, to the area of interest, you are limiting patient exposure, but what are you also doing with you guys, because most, most of the scatter radiation comes from where? Patients. It comes from the patient. So when we're limiting the size of the field, we're also limiting the size of uh, the amount of scatter radiation that we as technologists have to deal with. All right? What else does scatter radiation do to your image? It causes fog. It causes increased fog, so it diminishes the quality of the image. Okay. Now, the attenuation of collimators, what's attenuation? To absorb. Absorption. The absorption of the collimators must be equivalent to the attenuation of the protective housing. Attenuation of the collimators must be equivalent to the attenuation of the protective housing. Okay? I'm going to repeat that one more time. Why? Okay, good. <laughs> attenuation of collimators must be equivalent to the attenuation of the protective housing. This highlighted. Now the x-ray beam and the light, remember you have the light representing the x-ray field. So the x-ray beam and the light must coincide within two inches of the given SID. 
Two percent. What did I say? <laughs> okay, two percent. <laughs> the X-ray beam and the light field must coincide within two percent of the SID. Why is why is that an issue? I mean, why should we pay a lot of attention to that? Okay. So the light has to match the X-ray beam, mm -hmm. and if it doesn't match, what can happen? More you can what? Cut off anatomy. Okay, you can cut off anatomy. Okay. The PBL, the positive beam limiter, must be accurate to the image receptor, also within 2% of the SID. Okay, any questions? All right, let's keep on going. Beam alignment or congruency. So the field size is one thing. The field size have to match, but alignment is also important. Okay, so this is beam alignment congruency. The field light and the x-ray beam in which the light represents must also be aligned. An error must not exceed 2% of the SID. All right, so here we have a beam alignment device. We take an x-ray of that, and the exposure should fall within the circular tool that you use. Here's one in which it isn't aligned. So you see where the exposure is in comparison to the tool. You can also see where the BB markers are. This BB should be over here. Okay, so that's not properly aligned. So again, what's the issue with that? Okay, cut off, okay? Anatomical cut off. Okay. You may also be exposing parts of the body that you didn't intend to expose. Any questions here? Yes. Um, as far as the SID, because of the wear and tear of, of the machine, did, would that change a little bit with the SID? Increasing or decreasing? Okay, I'm, I don't think I understand your question. Okay, because of the wear and tear, maybe... Because of the wear and tear of what? Of, of the machine, of the tube. Okay. Would that affect uh, the exposure? Like the intensity of it? Okay, yeah, but we're not talking about intensity right now. So all we're talking simply is just beam representation. But you're absolutely right. With wear and tear, it is going to change the intensity of the beam. Eventually, you're going to have to keep kicking up your technical factors <coughs> to get a certain density on your image. Okay, but we're talking about normal wear and tear that happens later on down the line. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. All right, filtration. Filtration, okay, what is the purpose of filtration? Okay. Filter out the weak rays. Okay, remember the isotropic rays, it, it is heterogeneous, polyenergetic, right? It has many energies. So the beam is composed of low energy x-rays and high energy x-rays. So the purpose of the filter is to remove the low energy x-rays to make the beam more harder, more uniform. Okay, is that good for the patient? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Because otherwise, if we don't filter out the soft rays, guess who's going to be filtering it? Yeah. The patient, okay? So we're gonna filter it before it reaches the patient. So total filtration includes both inherent and added. What we have up here is the amount of filtration needed for machines operating with 70 kVp and above. You need a total of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalency. 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalency. If the machine is operating between 50 to 70, all you need is 1.5 and below 50 is 0.5, okay? Your inherent is up in your x-ray tube and down at the collimator box. You have one and 0.5, and then you have another added set of filtration between the tube and the box, which gives you 2.5. Okay, again, we're talking about machines operating at 70 kV plus. Any questions? Now, filtration isn't measured physically, okay? Because we're talking about uh, the attenuating properties of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum. So it has to have this type of characteristics. Remember how we talked about HVL last week or the last couple of weeks, which is 
account value layer, right? Mm -hmm. It is the amount of material necessary to decrease the intensity, original intensity that they're being by, by half, okay? So it could be aluminum, but it could be anything else, okay? So HVL isn't a physical measurement, but the concept of material, material used that has the same properties of a particular thickness of a material. <laughs> All right, any questions? Don't ask me to repeat that because I can't. <laughs> All right, reproducibility. Radiation intensity should be the same for each exposure, exposure utilizing the same technical factors. We do what is known as a reproducibility test. All right, so with the use of some sort of meter that measures the exposure rate, okay, we'll keep this meter in the room, okay? What, do you, what is it, an ion chamber? You guys did that already in class, right? For 140, 140 what? 143, 148, okay? So we would put a, uh, an ion chamber in there to measure the intensity or exposure rate coming from the X-ray tube. <coughs> And we would, for example, set these technical factors, 70 kV at 64 mass, and we would hit the exposure button and you should have a certain intensity reading, okay? Wait a few seconds, we will shoot it again. And you should get the exact reading, or close to it, okay? The variation should fall within 5%. There shouldn't be a variation of more than 5%. So if we shoot this set of technical factors over and over and over and over again, you should have the same intensity or exposure rate. Again, is that good? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Okay, we need to remain consistent. Any questions on reproducibility? Okay, on, on that, I did the QA, you know, at the hospital. Mm -hmm. This day, the same thing. Right. It could be. Okay, but there's something similar to that too. Okay, so we have reproducibility, but there's also linearity. Okay, linearity is similar to this, and that with linearity, the radiation intensity should be constant, even if you're using different combinations of ma and time, as long as the total mass is the same. Okay. So what we'll do here is we're going to keep KV the same, but we'll, we'll use different combinations of ME and time, equaling the same total mass. And again, mass is mass is mass is right. So if that's the case, then the exposure rate or intensity should also be the same. Right? Mm -hmm. So that's linearity. So I don't know what they did over there, Sophie. So it could be reproducibility or linearity, but they test for both. Okay, so it could be this one too. Okay. Okay, or one or the other. Okay. The maximum acceptable variation in linearity is 10%. Now here's the key though, okay? You can test different combinations, but they have to be sequential, sequential MA stations. Okay, so it should be the next MA station up or down. That's the key. Alright? So the maximum acceptable variation in linearity is 10% from one ME station to the next adjacent ME station. Okay, and it's expressed in millirankins per mass. Millirankins per mass. <clears throat> Operator shield, the control panel, and exposure switch should be located outside of the procedure room or in a booth, or fixed protective barrier separate from the procedure room. That's it. Mobile x-ray imaging system. Okay, a protective light apron sh should be assigned to each unit. Okay, because you are shooting x-rays without some sort of protective barrier between you and the patient. So you should be provided with some kind of lead protection. Now, I know the answer to this, okay? Your portables don't have the, the lead reprints, do they? They do, yeah, but do you know use it? Okay. But are you guys using it? Okay. 
I had brought that up at the advisory meeting, and I know a lot of you guys aren't using that. But are you guys using the six feet minimum? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. As long as you are far away from the source and the patient. Okay. The minimum of 0.25 to 0.5 millimeters of lead equivalent is necessary for radiation protection. The exposure switch itself should be uh, of an extension and operator operable at a distance of six feet. Okay, away from the x-ray source or, uh, so, I'm sorry, x-ray source and the patient uh, during exposure. All right. For fluoroscopic protection features, so that was x-ray, now we're going to talk about fluoroscopic protection features. We'll be talking about these things. Okay. First of all, are we familiar with the x-ray tube location in a fluoroscopic unit? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's going to be underneath the cradle or underneath the table. So you have your x-ray tube here. Okay, and it comes up this way, and then this is your image intensifier, which is above, okay? Now, the source to skin distance, we're not talking about source to, uh, source to image distance. In fluoroscopy, we refer to this as source to skin distance, and it's the distance between the fluoroscopic tube, okay, and the patient being irradiated. So the fluoroscopic tube is located underneath the table while the image intensifier is above. Changes in SSD will cause changes in output intensity to adjust screen brightness. In fluoroscopy, an increase in distance requires an increase in MA. Now, for some of you guys who are not familiar with fluoroscopy, fluoroscopy is dynamic, it's live. Okay? So, I added this because I know some of you guys don't understand the concept here. But let's just say, here's your x-ray tube, okay? You have x-rays going up into the patient. It is going to interact with the uh, image intensifier. All right? X-rays are converted into an electronic signal, okay? Which then gets focused at a point where now this electronic signal is converted into a light, okay, by photons, and it is a light signal that gives you your fluoroscopic image on a monitor. That's just kind of the short of it. Okay, so everybody got that? <coughs> X-rays to electrons to light to an image. X-rays to a stream of electrons to light an image on your display. Okay. This is going to make sense now of what we're talking about in the previous image. Okay. Changes in the SSD. The distance from your fluoroscopic x-ray and your tower and the patient is going to change the intensity of that beam. As we said, doesn't distance influence the intensity of the x-ray beam? Mm -hmm. So does it in fluoroscopy. Okay. The intensity and the amount of x-rays is what produces the brightness on your display screen. So let's just say, for instance, your SSD was increased. If you're increasing your distance, what happens to the intensity of the beam? <coughs> it what? Decreases. It decreases. So what do you think is going to happen to the image on the screen? It's also going to decrease. So it's not going to be, like you said, it's not going to be as bright. <laughs> so to adjust for that brightness, the fluoroscopic unit is going to increase automatically the increase the MA, or increase the number of <laughs> x-rays, which therefore will increase the brightness on the display screen. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Let's do the opposite. It's closer. Now it's more intense. What's going to happen to your display? Is it going to be too dark or too, too light? Too dark. It's going to be too dark. So the fluoroscopic unit is going to roll back a little bit on the MA, on the number of x-rays, 
to decrease the density. Decrease the density? Mm -hmm. Yeah, decrease the density on your display screen. Okay? So in fluoroscopy, an increase in distance requires an increase in MA. This is how it automatically adjusts the brightness on the screen. <coughs> what is that known as? ABC? You guys know what ABC is? What's ABC? Aren't you guys doing fluoroscopy? Mm -hmm. Automatic brightness control. Okay. The SSD <laughs> must not be less than 38 centimeters on a, sta a stationary flu uh, fluoroscope and not less than 30 centimeters on a mobile uh, fluoroscope. Okay, so the SSD must not be less than 38 centimeters on a sta stationary fluoroscope and not less than 30 centimeters on a mobile fluoroscope. Okay, questions? Okay, the primary protective barrier. We're talking about fluoroscopy again. The fluoroscopic image receptor assembly serves as the primary protective barrier in having 2.0 millimeters of lead equivalency. The fluoroscopic image receptor assembly serves as a primary protective barrier having 2.0 millimeters of lead equivalency. Okay. Now the fluoroscopic tower can only be activated when it is pulled across the table. If it's in a park position away from the table, it cannot be activated. Okay, so this is an active position this is an inactive position. This is parked. Okay, again, a safety feature. Filtration. The total filtration should be a minimum of 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalency. That's total. This includes the tabletop, the cradle, any material situated between the fluoroscopic x-ray tube, down here, okay, and the top of the table. So filtration is right here, this area right here. Okay, 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalency. Okay, 2.5 millimeters. <laughs> What was the thickness? <laughs> <laughs> Collimation. Collimation. So here is your display screen on a fluoroscopic unit. It is circular, circular in shape. Okay? The unexposed borders should be visible on the image. So you should actually see the shutters on the side <coughs> of your circular image. Okay, so unexposed borders should be visible on the image monitor when the input phosphor of the image intensifier is positioned at 35 cm, okay, 35 cm above the tabletop and the collimators are fully open. Automatic collimators should also adjust accordingly to the height of the floor towel. So even as you're putting your floor towel up and down, you should see the shutters also moving but at the periphery of the image. Was there a question, Daniel? No? Okay. Exposure control. The exposure switch should be of a dead man type. Okay? Because that's kind of the analogy that they make that you have to put pressure on the pedal when you're making an exposure. Dead men type of shoe have to be dead to put, put never mind, I don't know. I'm making stuff up. Okay, dead man type. 
Only when the weight of the foot is depressed on the uh, pedal or pressure is applied to the switch is exposure act activated. Now, there's two ways to make an exposure. You can either do it by foot, but also on the floral tower, there is a trigger mechanism that allows you to also make exposures. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we, I think we talked about this last week, pulsating floral, but also mm -hmm. the intermittent exposure okay, is also good for the patient. Because remember, we're dealing with dynamics, okay? So if the, the, uh, if the uh, technologist can let up on the floral petal when it's not being in use, that's a good safety feature. Okay? Now, quick question, guys. Are you guys allowed to uh, operate the fluoroscopic unit? No. Why not? Okay, let's just say you get your fluoroscopy certification. 